All right, guys, it's time for the next level guy show. A men's interview, interest, and improvement focused podcast featuring interviews with the greats from all industries to help you better your life. Each week, a new episode features an interview with one of the greats, covering all aspects of their story, from life hacks to tips and protocols that have allowed them to live life on the next level. We then highlight concrete action steps that you can use to improve your life. And now, your host, Ian Dawson McKay. And today's guest is Jack Lepiaz, aka Jax the Whipper. Jack is a professional circus performer, four time Guinness World Record setter, American journalist, stage and street performer, and social media sensation. Until recently, he was a radio anchor and producer at WBUR in Boston, Massachusetts. He's commonly known as Jack the Whipper, where he performs amazing tricks with a bullwhip, cracking the whip to the tunes of modern songs and demonstrating amazing tricks that wows his audience. A lifelong circus performer, he was on stage since before he could tie his own shoes. He now performs shows where he takes the timeless fundamentals of circus and repackages them for a brand new, younger audience. He performs at renaissance fairs around the country and appeared on season 17 of America's Got Talent. In this interview, we discuss whipping, showmanship, circus skills, chasing your dreams, owning your own weirdness, and so much more. And now, let's get to the interview. I mean, honestly, I'm a major, major fan of yours. I found you on TikTok and Instagram, and I've followed you ever since, but... Like we're just discussing, you are quite unique. I've got guys who are fitness guys or they're um, podcasters or whatever. How do you describe what you do? Because it's a hell of a job. Well, so what I like to say is it's stand-up comedy with a whip, Um, which is, you know, I am not the greatest whip cracker in the world. I am not... um, probably the funniest person in the world, but I've, what I've got is I've got a unique shtick, which is I draw on uh, a dumb mustache, a talk in a French accent. And, um, that character kind of informs the comedy and creates, you know, something fun. Cause when you balance out that you used to be a news anchor while you were doing this, you know, it, you kind of go, what on earth? But then when you look into your sort of history as well, I mean, your dad was a circus performer, but your mom's a lecturer, you know, like an academic. But do you think you were always kind of predestined to join and follow in his footsteps because of the upbringing you had? Or was it a turning point that you thought, yeah, I'm going for this? No, I think there are many paths I could have taken. Um, you know, there was a point where I was 14, 15, 16. I wanted nothing to do with the circus because I thought, you know, no one respects circus performers. Um, and I knew that from personal experience in, in, you know, the school system that I was in. Um, but I, you know, I gave, to, to use the term, I gave it the old college try, which is I was in journalism. I was in radio uh, 13 years with my most recent station, WBUR, but also four years of working at my college radio station. 17 years I was working radio and usually early morning radio. And a lot of the time, I enjoyed it a lot, um, and it was only in the last few years that I kind of really started to get that itch to kind of do something different, and that's you know kind of where we find ourselves today. So how did it, how was it with the the foot in each world, so to speak? Because I mean, I come from a family where we had sheep, but we were also quite we had money, but you know we did it because yeah. we inherited them and sort of stuff. So. We, I was a crofter, but also just a normal kid. Well, I don't even know if I was normal, but how did you find that with like one foot in the world of academia, one foot in the world of performance? Did you find it more entertaining than the lives of your friends? You know, did you ever feel the pull one way or the other? It's it's interesting. I mean, one, I mean, it always makes um, no matter what world you're in, people in that world want to know about the other world. So. If I'm in the real world, people want to know about the circus. If I'm in the circus world, people want to know about the real world. And it it always kind of makes you a unique person in those those areas, which is a double-edged sword. I mean, so 
sometimes people ask you the same questions, you know, that you've answered a bajillion times before. And you're like, dude, I'm just trying Sorry. to like, <laughs> I'm just trying to, no, 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 it's fine. But it's like when you just first meet someone, it's like, okay, I'm going to have to play this 20 questions all over again every time I meet someone, um, which is, it, it, it kind of gets old after a little bit. Um, what I find is one, it keeps life a little more interesting. You know, by the time you get sick of, you know, one world, you can kind of go into the other one and it's, it's, you know, it, you're happy to be back there. Um, but they also, it gives you freedom, um, which is that neither world is, you know, I don't need either job because I can always fall back on the other job if worse comes to worse. Um, and it gives you unique skill sets that most people don't have. You know, I've always said I'm, I'm much more flexible much more able to think on my feet um, than most people because of my circus upbringing. And that helped me immensely as a reporter where I could, you know, talk about live news as it was happening and, and generally keep a pretty cool head about it. So what kind of feedback though, did you get from like friends or strangers at this time? Because I mean, I was bullied in primary school and I think it definitely made me a weirdo, but I also made me a weirdo who runs a podcast and does jujitsu and stuff, you know? So it probably shapes us in a way. Did you have certain negative feedback from dickheads at school? Oh, tons. I mean, I, the, it's, you know, the way I always describe it is when you're seven years old, being the kid whose dad works in the circus, everyone wants to be your friend. And then around 12 or 13, that suddenly flips and you're suddenly cool. the weird kid, um, especially where I grew up, which was pretty uh, well-to-do area. A lot of people had, you know, parents who were investment bankers in New York City. Um, and, you know, we were not all that well-to-do. So you had both, you know, I think the socioeconomic difference and then also the, just the background, which is very different. And like I said earlier, there was, there was that stretch of time where I didn't want anything to do with the circus, but then I was, I think I was 16 and I was making I want to say six fifty an hour at an ice cream shop, um, which would you know translate to maybe you know eight pounds an hour. Um, and what? my dad offered me a day of work that would translate to I think something like twenty five or fifty dollars an hour uh, for the day of work. And I was like, oh, okay, all right, <laughs> let's uh, let, let's let's try and pursue this a little more. I love uh, I love what it's like. Okay, I'll pay. I'll give you money for something. You're like, all right, fair enough. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. But, and don't quote me on that dollars to pounds <laughs> translation. I mean, to be honest, your upbringing sounds amazing. Like, I, I love the idea of having a dad doing that and a mom doing, you know, and it's the best of both worlds. I mean, you're doing vigils with your dad, and you seem to have this amazing connection that very few people have. I mean, it was obviously a, a home filled with love and connection and doing stuff together, and not a lot of people have that, unfortunately. So how, well, I mean, yeah, it's, it was, it was kind of a, an interesting situation because it was also, my dad would be on tour for, you know, two or three weeks at a time, sometimes a month. And sometimes I would go with him rarely. Um, but a lot of the time I wouldn't. So I, you know, I wouldn't get to see him for a long period of time. And that was, that was really tough when I was younger. And how did you sort of adjust to that? Do you think it kind of gave you more sort of a confidence more like, did it shape you in a way that having that parent that wasn't there? Because I, I, my dad was a deep sea fisherman and I think I oh, struggled gosh, with no. it when I was younger. Jeez, I'm, I mean, I'm Scottish um, through and through. <laughs> oh, fair, fair. I think, you know, I think it taught me, you know, in a certain level of independence, um, you know, and I think that just comes with the circus upbringing, which is, you know, I've, I've always been very, very comfortable by myself on my own. Um, people are always shocked to hear this, but I'm an introvert. Um, I don't, you know, most of the time when I finish, when I finish a day of performing, I don't want to talk to anyone again for the rest of the day. Sometimes even in the middle of the day of performing, I'm like, no, do not talk to me. I am saving up my social battery to be on stage. Is that because of what songs people are suggesting? Because you get some not crackers. usually, you know, so I'm, I'm doing the Florida Renaissance Festival right now. I have to say, for the most part, aside from the, you know, every show, there's a free bird request. Uh, for the most part, they've actually been really interesting and really unique. I've gotten a lot of songs that I have never gotten before in the last couple of weekends. Because I love like the some of the TikToks where you get it's like sing you know like the latin version of the final fantasy game and it's like yes. free bird request and then it's it's all these kind of anime songs and it's but how does one get in 
Oh God, how does one? Honestly, I want to slap myself something. <laughs> how, how do you get into circus stuff? Because I'm assuming you would turn up and you'd help out behind the scenes and they would show you how to do something. Like how, what's the kind of entry for a young kid or somebody wanting to go into it? How do you start in the circus thing and sort of build your way up and create your own act and that sort of thing? Yeah. So the process on that, um, I mean, it was a decade long process. I learned how to crack a whip when I was seven, um, but I didn't start performing with whips um, when I started to get more serious about it when I was 17. Um, so the the process for me, once I kind of started performing solo, and this was after doing, you know, high school theater, high school drama, just get yourself comfortable in front of a crowd. Um, the process then was to figure out what the show is, kind of learn the tricks and just get comfortable telling jokes in front of a crowd. So what I did, um, starting very early in college was I just went out and street performed, um, mm. which is, it's a tough business. I'm still not a great street performer, but what's good about street performing is it gets you used to performing. It gets you used to performing in front of a tough crowd, um, and it, it helps kind of get rid of your fear of failure because when you street perform, you're going to fail a lot. Um, not in terms of, you know, your trick is going to get messed up, but just in that you're going to have five people watching your show and it's, you know, can you keep up the energy while you're doing that? Um, and so for me, it was a, basically it was rehearsal. It was dress rehearsal for two, three years. Um, and then once I had kind of gotten to the point where I felt pretty confident street performing, it was, can I move into these Renaissance festivals, which here in the U S are these, they're all around the country. They're kind of, they're kind of like carnivals. They're kind of like vaudeville, which is, um, it is loosely based on say late 1500s, um, England, but it's, you know, you'll get, you know, Rick King Richard at a time, you know, 400 years after he lived, um, you know, well, so the, the, the history is loose. The, the general setting is, is kind of what you're going for. Cause I love watching it and you've got like the torture ones and then you've got yes. the, the medieval knights and they look amazing. Like we have kind of like, you know, you see jousting while you have your dinner and you can dress up if you want, but I think yeah. it's few and far between, but I love how you guys go all into it. But how do you, this is probably going to be the question you're fed up of answering, but where does the whip come from? Where does the Jack the Whipper, where does drawing a French moustache on? <laughs> did, you, did you just let your personality run wild and see how, you know, what amused you would amuse others? Was this through your street performance? Like, how, how on earth did such a lovable character and an insane premise of an act come together? It was, it was a kind of an evolution. So, I mean, to, to go first, I picked up the whip mostly just because it was kind of what clicked for me. I tried a bunch of different circus skills. The whips worked and I liked Indiana Jones when I was a kid and my dad also did whip. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of all of these things together. Um, then the character of Jack the Whipper and then evolving that into Jacques Z Whipper was, so my father way back in the day was, uh, really successful Renaissance festival act. And, and his approach was always, um, you should have good tricks, but the good tricks don't necessarily make a great show. What makes a great show is having a unique character or a unique shtick or, you know, something that's going to make you different from if someone else were to pick up a whip and do your exact same show, what makes you different from them? And so what he what he kind of proposed, and this was summer going into my sophomore year of college, so my second year of college, um, university, it was, he said, okay, so you can, you can think about being, you know, this kind of pompous character, um, Jack the Whipper of, you know, you come out, I am the greatest whip cracker of, of all time. And I was like, you know, that doesn't really quite jive and that's a hard line to walk. And so, um, while we were, we were kind of brainstorming, he just kind of threw it. I mean, you could even be French. Um, <laughs> And I was like, wait a minute, that, that works. Um, because I think there is something, <laughs> uh, I think people are generally not threatened by an outrageous French accent. Um, <laughs> I was almost going to say people are not threatened by the French, but I don't want to say that I, I'm a, I'm a lover of the French, but, um, it was kind of this like, oh, okay, this clicks. And then after a couple of days of doing that show in the French accent, 
I realized I, f- I felt like people weren't quite picking up on that this is supposed to be a dumb act, and so hmm. I drew on the mustache just to see how it w- would work, and it was like it clicked. People got it from the get go. The laughs were bigger. Everyone seemed to understand where the show was, you know, what the show was faster. And here we are years later. I love it. Cause like every comment you were following, like there was such a community of love for you and people go out their way to annoy you and to bring these, like, you know, be part of the joke and go back and forth. And I was like, he gets it. You get like when you watch you perform, no matter what it is, you know, if it's with, um, like with your partner in crime, if it's with like random people in the crowd, you just have this knack for connecting. And I was really interested, like, but what then led you to not pursue that full time initially? What led you into journalism? Because it certainly seems like a, a weird paradigm shift for you, where you seem to be yeah. so good at it initially. Well, so it was this combination. I mean, I was I was decent when I was 20, 21, 22, when I started first started. Um, but to be very, very simple, I couldn't get the work. I couldn't find enough work to do it. Um, yeah. Had I had this level of work when I was 22, I probably would have done this full time then. Um, but all during this time, you know, I was kind of hedging my bets and making sure that I did journalism work. I, I worked at my college radio station. I interned for WBUR, where I would eventually end up working sort of the last semester of, of university. And then uh, they offered me a job uh, before I had even graduated. And so it was nice. like, okay, I've got this kind of part-time job that I can work while I while I set up the rest of my tour. It might take another year or two to, to kind of organize it. And along the way, I found I really enjoyed the work. Um, it, it, you know, I didn't always enjoy the hours getting up at 2.30 in the morning, working at 4 a.m., um, going until noon. And then it's like, you know, that wasn't always the best. But um especially once I got to, to start reporting and anchoring, it was like, oh, okay, I get to kind of put some of this, these performance skills to use in this other job. Um, that's really a lot of fun sometimes. And you get to see a lot of cool things. You get to learn a lot of interesting things. Because it, it definitely comes across like, as I've kind of tried to be a better interviewer and tried to be less, um, uh, uh, you know, looking at notes yeah. and all that kind of stuff, I okay, find yeah. that I notice from other people when they do it, I'm like, oh, he he's good. He gets it. You know, <laughs> you can hide. You can hide the shaking shitless like what I used to. And yeah. people go, "Oh, you did a really good job," and I'll be like, "What well, really?" Like, uh, but you have this general knack of just making it. Like, because I remember you saying sometimes that you were nervous. I was like, "Really? You certainly don't come across as nervous." But do you find like that was helpful? Because you're probably fed up of talking about. It, but you know, there is a lot of transferable skills. You know, you would have looked did you challenge yourself to be more out there in your performance and, you know, work on both sides of the coin? How did you find juggling both conflicting demands? Yeah. So I kind of, I would, it would depend on um, where I was and what I was thinking. So it's probably circa 2014. um, I started thinking about doing really doing radio full time. Um, which was a difference from what I've been doing the last three years, which was, you know, radio is here until I get enough circus work to support myself comfortably. And um, at that point, I had lined up probably almost enough circus work to do it full time. Um, but so what I started doing is I started pulling back. So so in 2014, um, I was performing about 27 weekends of the year, about half the weekends of the year. And once it was clear to me. I was like, all right, maybe let's, maybe this radio thing is, is going to work out. Um, I started cutting back. So I think 2015, I did 20 weekends, 2016, probably 16 or 15 weekends. And then the last few years, um, COVID obviously making things weird, uh, was generally 13 weekends of performing. I would do, you know, eight locally and then five on the road, mostly in the Northeast. Um, so mostly within driving distance of where I lived. So that was kind of, you know, how I managed those two things, you know, those, those two careers, just in terms of having time. And I saved my vacation time from, from the radio. So I could take, you know, I could go on tour when it called for it. Cause I, I love that you, I can see that similar path that I'm trying to go on that you've done. I mean, I run this podcast, but I also have a PhD program, uh, you know, coordinator in a university. Wow. 
and I'm juggling both worlds and I want to do like you were doing is take this and make it into its own business and do sort of offshoots and that. What did you find helped the most juggling both? Was it, you know, did you have such a desire for both that it wasn't a hardship or did you find you needed certain habits or a certain kind of mindset or approach to making them both work together? I think so for me, a couple of things. I mean, one, the, the circus money was always pretty good. Um, and that, that really made it, um, kind of feasible where it was like, you know, I could use this circus money to pay off my student loans, which, you know, um, that's a huge deal. Um, being able to, I was able to pay off my car with, with, with circus performing. Um, so that it, it offered me a level of freedom that I, a lot of my friends um, around my age did not have, um, just having dual sources of income. As far as though the scheduling, what I, I just have gotten into the habit of efficiency in all things. Um, just any way that I can shave 10, 15, 20 minutes off of a task or um, a series of tasks, you know, so like when I go grocery shopping or when I, when I would go grocery shopping, it would always be on the way home from work. Almost never, you know, after I got home, go back out. So I would go to the grocery store that was on my way home in and out in 15 minutes. I knew exactly where everything was. Um, do that as quickly as possible. Um, I would, you know, edit videos while I was backstage at, um, while, while performing or something like that. So it was just trying to figure out like, okay, how can I condense this as much as possible and, and make it work? And then the other thing is also, I mean, just, I didn't take a lot of vacation time. So I used my vacation time to, to work, unfortunately. I love how, I love how somebody knows that pain of like, okay, I'm going home and everybody else is watching TV and you're prepping for something, you're planning for something, you're working at something and you never switch off, do you? And it's a really difficult thing to do, but is that why you kind of want to keep, like, you know, doing your street performance and presenting and that stuff? You know, it's how did you keep your skills getting developed at that time? Was it just interacting with the crowds and having the fun and learning the new skills? You're like... You know, when when you're doing this, how did you shape a performance? Was it just throwing enough shit at the wall and hoping something stuck, or did you have mostly a mostly that, that? Yeah, yeah, mostly just a lot of throwing stuff at the wall. I mean, so the show itself hadn't really changed for a while. Once I once I kind of made that decision that I was going to focus more on radio, I kind of stopped trying to develop new material um, just because I was like, well, there's no point in me spending this time to develop this material, I'm just going to keep going on what I have. And then we'll, you know, whenever I stop performing, um, then it's done, it's over and done with. And the, the tricks were not, we're at the point where I had been doing some of these tricks for already for a decade. I didn't really need to rehearse them on a daily basis. You know, before a season would start, I would go out and I would just kind of rehearse, run through everything, make sure I, you know, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um, but then uh, once I did start thinking about doing this full time, I was like, oh, OK, all right, let's 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 try and update some of these tricks and make this work again. Um, and basically wrote an entire new show in time for this past season. So how would you define your act? Because it seems to be, you know, some tricks and some interactions, et cetera. And then there seems to be this bit of throw out some ideas to the audience, get the interaction bit of banter back and forth a few insults go you know yeah. how much of that is planned or how much how do you encourage that level of interaction that lets your sort of creative genius flow out uh well th i thank you i don't know about creative genius i what i find is um i actually was just hanging out with two other whip performers uh just last week um aaron bonk and tiny girl big show and we were kind of talking about our approaches. And what I realized is that I wing it a lot more than most performers. Um, this guy too. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I find I do my best work under stress um, while I'm trying to improv, um, improvise. And so the way my show is structured is the first five to 10 minutes is all just mostly improv i'll do i do two kind of preset whip songs it's always we will rock you and then another whip song of some sort but then i go into audience requests and that's you know 
90% of what you see on my TikTok, which is me saying like, okay, what do you want? Really? You want that? Okay, let's try and do that on the fly. Um, but then beyond that, there's another 25 minutes of scripted material, um, whether it's working with targets, uh, fancy whip tricks, um, explaining why a whip cracks to people, um, and then finishing with the whip on fire. But even within those, the Renaissance Festival crowds are such that they they like to be vocal. They like to say things, um, you know. So even <laughs> during the scripted bits, even during the scripted bits, they will yell stuff out. And sometimes I, sometimes I respond to it. And sometimes the challenge you can get into with too much improv is uh, things get too off the rails. Um, you need to keep the show semi-structured so it can come to its log logical conclusion. And sometimes people will yell out stuff, you know, when you're trying to set up a bigger laugh down the road, where if you acknowledge them, that spoils the joke later on. Um, it's not always the best thing to go for the quick, easy laugh when you're building up a larger, bigger laugh, um, which has been a source of tension with me and some of my performing partners in the past. <laughs> Because you've you've mentioned that you're sort of, you're quite introverted, like mm -hmm. how do you switch into this alter ego? Is it like Venom and he's you know Jack's always inside you, or do you have like a pre? I always want to say like pre match ritual. How how do you switch yeah. in, or do you just get your whips and go, fuck it, let's do it? Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I can get the whips and just kind of go into it, but that never quite works out for me. Um, it's a lot of caffeine, first and foremost. Um, the second thing I, I do is I kind of cycle through pump-up songs. So like you mentioned One Winged Angel, the, the Latin song from Final Fantasy. For a long time, that was the song that I would listen to right before I went on stage. Uh, right. I, find, I find some kind of music that kind of makes me feel centered, makes me feel focused. Um, and then that's kind of the last impression I have right before I go on. So right before I go on stage, chances are I am backstage for three minutes listening to something that's too loud on my headphones. And then as soon as the song ends, headphones go down, we come out and it's time to be on stage. And so I kind of, I, I have that adrenaline to carry me out at the start. I love that. I love how you like, it's what people are asking for is actually the thing that you pump yourself out with. Do you think then that, do you, do you become a different person when you perform? Do you get this like level of confidence? Do you like, are you believing that you're someone else? So the, the normal Jack gets left behind and you can put everything in out and let this personality blossom or what? One of my, one of my favorite kind of um, analyses that I've always, or, or examples I've always liked. Uh, and it's a nerdy one is the spider-man reference which is spider-man you know peter parker uh nerdy kid shy quiet um doesn't talk a lot mm -hmm. and then this the way he kind of finds confidence is in this alter ego where suddenly because he's got this mask on he can he can talk a lot and he talks too much while he's you know fighting bad guys <laughs> and insulting them and delivering uh. quips and that's kind of the way i've always felt about it which is you know, Jaxi Whipper is is me dialed up to eleven, but also a lot of my positive qualities kind of amplified um, to to give me some of that. I don't know extra confidence. You know, drawing on the mustache, it's like, all right, no, I'm a different person now. Um, but while still the same person, you know, I don't say anything on stage that I would not say in real life. Um, that's an important thing. Because I was always interested in how you train for it, because I've seen the videos you do where you're like whipping cans apart and stuff like that. Mm. But then how do you bring like a training plan for that? Like how do you work on that part, your, your personality or that kind of thing? Because you would obviously, you feed off oh, the God. crowd, it seems reactive, you know, and you can hardly go down the street and start <laughs> randomly insulting people. Well, yeah. you could, but, you know. You could, how, yeah. <laughs> so like, what I is there? Well, so what people, I think what people forget is, I mean, I've been doing Renaissance fairs, one, my whole life, but I've been doing this solo. I've been doing Jacques C. Whipper now for 14 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, and because I started so young, I've got, I know this show inside and out. Um, you know, there's no written script anywhere. It's just, it's memorized up, up in my head. Um, 
And the show is so flexible that it can change and morph depending on what the audience is. So the crowd work is kind of just, at this point, it's very rare that someone says something I haven't heard before. Um, so I have either a list of lines saved up, or if they do say something new, it's kind of just, you know, observational comedy of, you know, they're, when they ask for three you know, sexual songs in a row. It's like, oh, okay, I can figure out where this is going. And you kind of just work through that. Because that's the beauty of it, because it's like, sometimes you need to be on that moment, don't you? You need to have it happening to to bring out the best in a performer. You know, it's like the you play your best at the World Cup final, but you don't always, you know, you've never done it before, but just the the actual event brings it up. I mean, one of your one of my favorite videos you've done was where you performed with your dad, you know, and you, oh yeah, he took the lead and you kind of slotted into the sidekick role, so to speak. You know, the, how was that? Was that like a sort of like everything coming together to uh, share the stage with your dad to to you know for him to sort of be part of your act? How did you feel about that? You know, how did how did I was relieved. Perform, yeah. <laughs> I was relieved because I didn't have to do as much in the show. <laughs> um, he took, he took no, over. It, it was amazing. Yeah. Well, the the great thing about my dad is, you know, he did he did rent airs way back in the day, but for the last twenty five years, he's been doing his show has been the Super Scientific Circus, where he teaches science to children. So uh, obviously a show that is safe for children. And so, and the show that he joined is a show that is very much not safe for children. (laughs) And the way I proposed it to him, I said, you know, the way that you can kind of fit in immediately with this group is to just be the like lecherous old man, uh, the dirty old man. And I think that'll go over really well. And he, he ran with it more than I ever thought he could. So, I mean, one, I mean, he, he, he knocked it out of the park. But then also, I mean, performing with him was this interesting experience because I hadn't ever, the last time we performed together was, uh, had been half of my life ago. I, I was 16, I think the last time we Sheesh. performed together, maybe 17. Yeah. So, um, and that was just when I was first starting. Um, hmm. And then, you know, to bring him back now when I'm kind of, you know, probably at my peak, uh, it was it was a lot of fun because I love how he just it's like he just rolls out of bed and he's my performer, you know. Like it, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can see this level of mastery that he has with it, and there's no nerves. It's just he slots into a complete what should be a completely alien environment. You know, it's your show, your so your community, and he's just like, right, follow me, watch me. You know, we'll do this. It's time for a quick break. There are millions of potential products to buy, so how do you know which ones are worth your hard-earned money? Simple. You go to nextlevelguy.com affiliates and explore those that will transform and improve your life. You'll find deals, listener exclusives, and special offers with some great companies. Recommendations are 100% honest and only on items Ian has tried or believes in. The company showcased will make you a better man in all areas of your life. Simply go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and level up. How do, how does it feel then to be doing the same kind of like Renaissance fairs, the things that you would have seen him perform at? How do you know? Do you when you're performing? Do you use that kind of w- small wins and that kind of confidence from the night before to to get to inject more performance ability in the next one? Do you use like the confidence you get from one show to the next, so you get better and better as you go on? Do you think? Um, I mean, I try to take I try to take lessons from shows. But I also try to keep a pretty short memory with shows, whether they're good or they're bad, because every crowd is usually, with exception of maybe three or four people, completely different from from the show before. Um, 
So, you know, if you have a bad first show, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a bad second show. If you have a great first show, it doesn't mean you're going to have a great second show. You know, every crowd is different. Um, one of the big things is kind of figuring out the energy of a crowd, um, which is, you know, are they, are they a little more sleepy? So like, here's a, here's an example. Last weekend here in the U S you know, we moved the clocks forward one hour. So, you know, you lose an hour of sleep, uh, Saturday night into Sunday morning. And so my 1130 show for everyone, it feels like it's 1030 and I get out there. I've I'm on plenty of sleep. I went to bed early. I had extra coffee. I'm, I'm doing fine. And I come out and I realize I'm like, this audience is a little quieter than I'm used to. Um, and so what I did in that case is you kind of slow down to match the audience's energy. Um, which was very different from what I had experienced most of the time in Florida, which is they are rowdy and oftentimes they are drunk. So it has been, you know, for a lot of time, it's I've had to raise my energy level of like, no, we can't slow down on the show. We have to be loud, aggressive, talk over people, barrel over hecklers. Um, and that has not, that was kind of the one show where I was like, oh, oh, okay, let's, let's do this like a normal show, I guess. <laughs> It sounds like you'd be a good act in Scotland, I'm telling you. The, you know, <laughs> drunk and rowdy. Yep, you're there. <laughs> I've, I tell you, I've heard I've heard stories about the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Yo, you'd fit well in there, trust me. You would yeah. go down a storm. And I love that approach then of like you're not like dwelling on the bad things or you're you're not focusing on the good things. You're immediately just going, What went right, what went wrong? Okay, next one. And I like that. I like that way of looking at. Like I always say, how do you analyze a performance? How do you make it better? And I like how you're kind of, oh well, you know, I can't do anything about that. It's happened. Let's go to the next one, and then you gauge off the audience. Uh, that's a really nice approach. But when you're performing, you travel round. You know, you're living in hotel rooms. You're probably eating like a bachelor again. How do you make a hotel room a base? How do you, you know, because. I find a lot of people are great at home, but the second they play away or they perform away or whatever it is, they can't cope with that. You know, they they go to yeah. pot. Yeah, I well, it's it's interesting because Ren, uh, Renaissance fairs, the day is so long, you don't actually spend that much time at the hotel room. Um, you wake up. I mean, most shows, I I'm up at six thirty or seven a.m. that morning. Um, mm -hmm. and then I don't get home until seven thirty eight PM. So it's a 12 hour day. That's a by the shift. time you get home. Yeah. By the time you get home, you're having dinner and you're going to bed basically. Um, so my approach is, I mean, I have a, a, a kind of a certain, a few routines. One of the things is, um, in the morning, no matter what I try to always not try, I do have a really good breakfast with, you know, bread, cheese, meat. I want something that's going to sit in my stomach for a while that I can, I can keep, yep. you know, that that's going to sustain me for at least, you know, three, four, five hours. Um, during the day, I tend to not eat all that much. Um, it's kind of light stuff. I might have a little, you know, peanut butter jelly sandwich. I might have some cashews. I might have a protein bar or something like that, but it's not anywhere approaching a real meal just because Renaissance fairs, are you know it's hard to get good food it's hard to or i should say not say it's hard to get consistent stable food a lot of these fairs actually do have really good food um but i don't like to buy festival food i like to bring my own um but also i just don't like to eat heavy during the day and then dinner for me is something big probably i'm probably going to a restaurant or i'm probably getting fast food on the way home um but I've burned so many calories during the day that I'm not worried if I have a huge, huge meal at the end of the day. Because I remember seeing that video of you saying like what you would eat in a normal day, and it was like, I'm sure I had that in like in college, you know, like that constant just like because yeah, <clears throat> is that are you not like how do you have rules about your diet or do you have rules like about your water or hydration? Are you, are you just in the mm -hmm. moment and you just drink if you're thirsty, you eat if you're hungry? It depends on the situation. So um, usually I, I, with each festival, cause each, each festival has a different, slightly different schedule. Um, so my home show King Richards um, I'm able to, I kind of have a schedule of like, all right, this is when I'm going to have an apple and a little and a protein bar. This is when I'm going to have my peanut butter jelly sandwich. Um, 
and and whatnot. The one kind of constant beyond the getting a good breakfast is I try to always some point in the morning drink an entire Gatorade, Powerade, some kind of sports drink um, just to kind of preload my body with those electrolytes because I know I'm going to sweat them out. Normally, I'm not a huge stickler for hydration. I drink when I'm thirsty. Um, The one exception has been down in Florida where it's, you know, I'm going from in Boston where it's still winter. We got snow two days ago to Florida where it's, you know, I'm going to try and convert to Celsius real quick. Um, I think it was 90 degrees, which is about 33 Celsius, I believe. So I'm going from zero to 33. Yeah, I, I would have no a clue roughly. if you're right or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I know the the way I I figured out is that like Fahrenheit or Celsius is like zero to ten is still cold, ten to twenty is f- all right. Um, twenty to thirty is you're getting on the warmer side of things, but you're not outrageously hot. And thirty above is just it's just hot. There's no way no way mm. around it. But that's I might be off on that. It was like when we went to Dubai. It was like, and oh, get, God. Uh, we got off the plane at midnight, like their time, and the pilot said, "And the local temperature is thirty degrees." And I thought, "That's just wrong." That no, no, yep. no, no. I mean, I'm yep. from Scotland. We're lucky if we ever see double digits in a year. You know, it's yeah. So, how have you taken? Are you are take, you that far north in Scotland? Um, well, I live in I'm in Glasgow now, but I'm fr- okay. originally from the Highlands of Scotland, so it's up like oh, God. Um, yeah. Think of Game of Thrones, like we're on yeah. the we're fighting the White Walkers half the time up the Highlands. You know, it's yeah. Well, usually they're off to the pub at that point, but <laughs> but you've taken this like this amazing sort of traditional circus performance, and you've repackaged it for the more modern, you know, kind of TikTok. I need everything in thirty seconds, a minute reels, all these sorts of things. How have you kind of combined the two? Do you think because our audience nowadays, they need it short, sharp, funny. You know, we they don't always deal with waiting for a punchline that might be a whole show. Have you found a way to kind of merge the two? Because you you seem to have a great way of doing both. Have you what have you found about content, creating content in both those kind of areas? Well, I think I mean social media has helped me just kind of stay up to date on what the kids are into these days. So I can you know, I just, I'm I'm I throw a lot of meme jokes out there, you know, so, um, you know, depending on what is trending on TikTok or Instagram or something like that, sometimes that'll show up in the show, whether it's, um, the Chrissy wake up song that was going around the internet all, all summer, you know, that, that was in, in the show for, you know, a few weeks, not, not that long. Um, but so the other thing I've tried to do with my comedy, because I've always been, um, the kind of person where I hate acts that build up to a trick and take five or six minutes to build to that trick Mm. in such a way that you're just arbitrarily trying to create tension. Um, And that's where I've always felt like things slow down. And that's a, that's a big style in street performing because a lot of the time in street performing, people walk away after you do a trick, they're there to see you do the trick and then they leave. Um, So it's, it's more common in street performing, but what I've tried to do is my comedy is the punchlines are quick and they are constant. Um, so I have, you know, a bit where I'm talking about um, s- wild animals in the woods. And what I did was earlier in the show, I set it up that there's someone in the crowd that anytime I say Jaxi Whipper, they will honk a horn twice, anytime. And so what I'm doing during this bit is I'm setting up this trick and this is me. I'm putting uh, an animal over here to, 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 as a target, an animal over there as a target. And the way I'm doing this is I'm interspersing and I say, you're walking through the woods and you come across a dangerous bear. You call for me, Jaxi Whipper. And out of the crowd, just out of nowhere, you just hear a honka honka. <laughs> and that gets a laugh. So as I'm you know, very seriously putting this out, that's where you kind of keep the audience engagement going on. And it's, uh, I try to not go too long without a laugh ever. Because you it certainly doesn't seem like anybody ever has a bad time. Everybody's constantly, you know, it's like that uh, thing. They get all get pulled together. It's like, uh, 
it's a private joke with the audience and you. You know, it's like one of these things where I think um, Dara O'Brien, and a comedian up here, he does mm. a, a completely different act by just taking the mick out of the crowd. But, you know, it's like you had to be there. So then it encourages yeah. the next people. Do you think that works for you, that you have the section of the show where no two days are the same, where you're obviously bouncing off each other and having that ability? You know, how, how can that be learned, do you think, that ability to go with the, go with the flow? You know, how can people get better at that? Because you seem to have this knack of doing it. I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, taking improv classes is always um, a good thing. Um, it's I, I did a lot of improv classes when I was a kid, so that might be where I got some of that from. But it's it's been a huge asset for me. I've had audience members who are regulars um, at my shows come up and say, "We love your act because you know, even though you have the same bits every time, every time we go, it is a different show. It is a different, you know." Mm. Things are different. Things go weird. Things go awry. Um, you know, sometimes that they go really well. And so, yeah. yeah, you know, it's 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 all part of the part of the fun. Um, and so, what I what I like about that is <clears throat> one, it makes it different for the audience. Two, it makes it different for me, um, which means that I can do the same show three, four, five times a day and not get super bored with it. Um, and every crowd is different. Every, you know, every set of crowd hecklers is different and that, that goes a long way. But I, yeah, as far as learning that skill, I, I don't know. It's interesting because I have this, I understand, I think a lot of the concepts of theater and entertainment and, and, and comedy, but I don't have a formal training in it. I just have, I grew up in this world and I've kind of learned a lot of these things by osmosis. And so you know, when I, when you ask me, how does someone train on this? I'm like, uh, go do it, I guess. That's, that's, mm. you know, kind of what I would say. No, I love it. I love how you're just using your personality to be you dialed up to 11. You know, you're just kind of, you're probably not able to start swinging a whip around in your, your day-to-day life, but, you know, and did you see a change then in your audience or the kind of nucleus of the show because the audience obviously play a big part in it when you were on america's got talent did it change at all or did it just oh god bring more weirdos in to let you just go to town (laughs) um agt didn't change a whole lot other than people saying uh they saw me on tv i mean the performance itself was very different um in that it was it was a lot more scripted than I'm used to. Um, I still wow. ended up winging a little bit of it, <laughs> quite a bit of it. Uh, I was I was not planning to use Simon Cowell for that trick. Everyone's like, "Was that scripted?" I'm like, "No, it was not." Or if it was, they didn't tell me. Um, I was, but I, I just want you to him. <laughs> I was yeah, just like, I, yeah. throw him away. You're not, you know, you're not the first person to say that to me. <laughs> um, it's um, it's. I think AGT. I'm glad I did AGT. Um, I don't feel like it changed a whole lot. It was more symptomatic of kind of what was already happening, um, you know, with the, the growth in social media. Um, but it was a lot of fun and I'm glad I did it. Cause I mean, I remember you in an article, you mentioned how, um, you spent a long time trying to fit in and then you realize it's better to be the true you, you know, and do you think that let the real Jack come out and play? to do these amazing things, to do these amazing shows. Because what would you say to somebody just now who is like, because I spent years trying to fit in at the bars, go with friends to you yeah. know, and sit and drink pints and go, what, what am I doing here? You know, now doing the podcast and all that, I've never been happier. What would you say to somebody then who's wanting to do whatever it is, who was in, who's like that, trying to fit in and not let their real, real personality out? Is there a two tricks or hacks that you could get say to them that would encourage them to find their true self? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I'm a big fan of is um, my brother introduced this to me maybe ten or eleven years ago, which is this this concept that um, it's you you focus on what your strengths are, um, and this there is a book called Strengths Finder, which is kind of like. You know, it's kind of like one of those online quizzes. You answer a series of questions. It, it sort of tells you what your strengths are. But um, I took it and I was like, okay, this this kind of 
tells me, you know, that my strengths were adaptability and flexibility was number one. Um, and that for me, 100% tracks. And, but what it really was, was it kind of changed my thinking in terms of focusing rather than like, okay, how can I get better at this skill that I'm not very good at focusing on, okay, what am I already good at and how can I lean into those strengths to make them work even more? Because what I found is if you're leaning into your strengths and you're doing work that you enjoy uh, or work that you're, you know, that suits your strengths, you're going to enjoy the work, number one, and you're going to be better at the work. Um, hmm. So that's kind of like the like nitty gritty nuts and bolts. Um, the other thing is also find what you enjoy and 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 do that and don't feel like you need to do things like go to the bars um, or or this or that. You know, own your own your weirdness, and you'll you know, I think you'll have a much better time in this life. Because look, if you're living a lie, uh, or if you're living a way you know a way that you think society says you should. Um, and obviously I'm going to add in the disclaimer of like, you know, don't be a violent person. Um, you know, you should follow society on, on, you know, not attacking people in the street. Um, but as long as you're, you know, and you're doing it in such a way that, um, doesn't harm yourself or others, I think you're going to have a much, much happier life. Um, and chances are a more successful like life. Because it was something like when I found your material, I was like, oh, this guy's hilarious. He's really good at it. And, you know, you're just fun to watch. And then I remember, I think it was with your your former radio station, You were, they were speaking to one of your black colleagues, and he said, oh, we obviously have negative connotations with yeah. whipping. And then you have videos where you've gone away and you've been sent a whip from, like, a particular culture, and you're learning about how it's used and stuff. Do you think, that sort of your deep diving into whipping into learning these skills has it shown you more about the world you think has it made you a better performer because you've understood the you know the how these tools are used in society and the cultural values to that and performance in general i know it's a bit of a up here question but no no i, I like it uh, i think you know so i've I don't know that the show itself has done it, but I, I've grown as a person um, over the years, and that has informed how the show has changed. You know, when I first kind of started this, my impression of whips was it's Indiana Jones. And I learned that not everyone has that thought when they first see a guy with a whip. And so, I, you know, mm. part of the Jaxi Whipper being non threatening is, you know, okay, how can we make whips in general? less threatening um as far as you know some of the other jokes in the show there were jokes in the show that um probably weren't sensitive they wouldn't be pc today um and they've been cut out since then um because at the end of the day i think the most important thing that when you're a performer is making sure that everyone at your show feels welcome and feels like they need to be there um, that doesn't mean that you need to come out, I think at the start of the show and say, Hey, everyone's welcome at this, at this act. Um, mm. but I think there are ways you can do that subtly by indication, by your mannerisms, by how you treat people that can help people understand. <clears throat> One of the things I always make sure to do is, um, I, I, after every show I take pictures and photos and talk with anyone who wants to talk with me after a show. Um, and there have been people who are, uh, part of marginalized groups. And what I've always tried to do with them is, you know, if they are someone say who's trans, I say, Oh, Hey, what's your name? And I call them by that name. Um, do I try not to nowadays assume anyone's pronouns, um, stuff like that. I love it because it's, it certainly comes across as, uh, we're all together. We're, you know, we're, we're part of a family when you, when you look at your content. And I think that's a big thing of like, you don't, it's, it's difficult because I watched it and I thought oh, Indiana Jones and it's really cool and stuff. I never thought the connotation that it would have to people who like families who had members who were slaves and stuff like that. And it's, I was like, Oh, I never even thought about that. And it just shows the difference of how, different tools can be visualized or the the stigma they have attached and 
I was like, and then you have such a way of bringing everybody, young, old, insane, <laughs> normal, into the into your conversations. And I, I love how you're bringing that into like let, making people think and being safe and making a, a safe space. And that. So you do all this amazing stuff. You know, you're whipping fire. You're like getting guys to wear helmets and whipping cans off their heads and all you know like yeah. there's knives and all sorts of insane stuff you know your tiktok is amazing Every, I, everybody should come and watch your videos but how do you deregulate from this how do you kind of go back to being jack you know going and getting food and stuff like how do you calm yourself enough to get to sleep because i imagine you must be up here with emotional highs and the confidence and stuff it's honestly, it's usually not that hard. Um, it's um, the sort of the, just the three hours at the end of this. So like, let's say the festival closes at seven, the three hours between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. That usually is enough to just, you know, kind of decompress, get out of character. It used to be that I had to listen to kind of like slower, uh, sometimes sad music at the end of the day to, to kind of get back out of character. I don't need that anymore. Um which is, I think I'm just so tired at the end of the day, the natural physical exhaustion will do it. Every now and then, you know, there's there's a show that's so good that I'm like, oh man, I'm still kind of buzzing from it, you know, maybe an hour or two hours later, but it's rare that that continues beyond, I would say, honestly, an hour or two after the show. Because I've certainly found recently with like asking a lot of the big name people, you know, like, what's your protocol for this? What's your... A lot of them just go, I just try to eat healthier. You know, I just go back and I'm like oh, yeah. tired to go, you know. And I think sometimes we think there's secret hacks and you must have this, some um, like guru telling you. And, you know, a lot of them it's just like, I eat when I'm hungry. I try not to eat crap all day. And it's like, yeah, oh, fair enough. And we yeah, forget. I mean, I... yeah, I mean, my fitness routine when I'm at home is a little more regimented, but I mean, that's, that's, we don't need to get into all of that, um, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's really, I mean, at the end of the day, getting out of characters is, is pretty simple just because you're so tired, especially, you know, like down in Florida where it's been so, so damn hot. It's like, by the end of the day, I am just fried, literally, metaphorically, emotionally, you name it, I'm there. I love it. It's, because you have such a great relationship like your wife is involved in a lot of your video editing she even made sure you had your perfect lighting just now you know which turned the light on. <laughs> it's yes. it's all these amazing things like how do you find that part of you know you're recently married you've got your cat you know i'm sure you're thinking about other things and you know you're like building a, a home and you seem to have this great relationship how do you find that pressure then of traveling away and doing these things? Cause it must draw on you. The, so the approach that we've kind of taken and, you know, we'll see how it goes. This, this Florida trip is about a month long and it's kind of the, the initial test for us, which is, you know, I was gone for about two weeks. I'm back for a week and we'll go back together. Um, so we're only apart for about two weeks of this, you know, five week run. Um, the, challenge will be this summer when I'm further away and for a longer period of time. But even in that situation, what we've tried to do is organize that every two weeks or so, one of us is flying to go see the other. Um, whether okay. it's I'm flying back to Boston, she's flying out to wherever ever I am, um, just to make sure that um, we're still in touch. We're still you know, communicating. And we've set kind of on top of that, we've set organized times where like every Saturday night as I'm heading home from the fair, I call her um, so that she and I can kind of just talk, check in on the day. Um, she can hear about how it went and then we'll check in, you know, do a, a, a larger check in during the week. But it's kind of a like, hey, let's make sure that even when I'm working and when I'm performing, we're still we're still communicating. We're still asking, you know, hey, how was your day? Stuff like that. I love that because I, I see a lot of people kind of going, we fell apart while I was living, you know, I was doing like offshore, yeah. you know, three weeks on, three weeks over. And a lot mm -hmm. of people struggle with that. You know, it's it's fine when you're together, but suddenly the distance creates these worries. And you guys just seem to have this great relationship no matter what. And it's always like the end jokes and, you know, because you, like you're traveling the world and I'm sure girls are throwing themselves at you, guys are wanting to be, uh, <laughs> and you just seem to have this great relationship. And 
I was so I was so keen to uh, to talk to you about those things. Like you have an amazing relationship with how do you say it? is it, Sir Chris, your your partner in crime? Yes, Seth Carney. Seth Carney. I don't know where it's yeah. getting Chris from. My brain's not working at the moment. No, it's all good. <laughs> but where, like, what does that taught you about friendship? About him putting himself in a position to be the sidekick to do all these potentially dangerous like activities. What's it taught you about sort of friendship and working together? Cesar, I mean, Cess is a dream partner in in so many ways, which is he's he is pretty much down to do whatever it needs to be done um, in any circumstance. And he's also um, he knows kind of what we are trying to do together, um, which, you know, when we first started working together, his, you know, he hadn't done a whole lot of improv. So sometimes it was it was hard working with him. And there was this point um, after a couple of years where suddenly I was like, you're really fun to work with. Your improv has gotten really good. And now it's at a point where he and I have worked together so many years that we can kind of almost do stuff without the other person. You know, like we can almost communicate with our eyes what we want to accomplish yeah. uh, without telling the the audience. And it's this 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 great feeling. Um Going back to my, my wife for a second, um, what I found with her, the approach that we have tried to take um, is making sure that it's, it's a partnership in all things. Um, you know, she films and edits my show. So <clears throat> she knows, you know, what should be done for the most part with, with film editing, video editing. Um, I generally do not tell her what to do there or what edits Brave to make. Man. Brave um, man. Never tell a woman. Well, what to yeah, do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there there are times where I'll say like, okay, that doesn't need to be in there. But the edits are very rare. Um, what she does is is really, really, really good work. But then it's also little stuff like you know, help with the chores around the house. It's stuff like that. Um, you know, just just treat your relationship like a partnership, like it's the two of you working together, um, as mm -hmm. opposed to a you know a division of labor. She does this, I do that. You know, it's. We'll see. I mean, we'll see. We've only we haven't even been married a year yet, so we'll see if it works. But we've been together, you know, seven plus years at this point. So, so what what do you want the the evolution of this to be? I mean, I'd love to have you on again, and we can go into like learning tracks and oh, yeah. doing all sorts of stuff. But what do you want this to be? Are you happy to continue doing the TikTok version? Are you wanting to have your own kind of like? company showing people how to do the tricks how to help people find their real character to be better performers what what would you want your evolution of your brand to be at this point i don't know um you know it's it's my my goal has been to make circus performing my main source of income and we're just a month into that being you know my new reality so where we go from there, I don't know yet. Um, you know, I've I've signed with an agency who have you know some ideas of of things we want to do. Um, there are some things that I would like to do at some point in my life. Um, but honestly, my my biggest goal is I want to be financially secure, and I don't want to work so hard that it puts a strain on my marriage. That's those are my two big concerns you know my, my my two big aspirations for the rest of my life and it's probably the ones that'll keep you keep you sane and happy <laughs> and I, yeah. I love how that you know you're not saying i'm gonna have fifty thousand pounds i'm gonna do this, this you're just like i just want to continue enjoying it and i don't want to get in trouble with the missus that, that, to me that sounds safe and how did you overcome that fear then to say to take a job that was definitely going to pay your wages but you're always going to work for somebody and go right that's it i'm going to do my own thing the money actually i mean the the circus money started to overtake the 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 um radio okay. money um and it wasn't close you know i was looking at like the earning potential by leaving bur versus the earning potential for staying at bur the radio station and it was it was really a no-brainer once you really boiled it down. The other thing to keep in mind is it was not a guarantee that I would, you know, continue working at BUR. Um, the job that I had there was one that, you know, in my 13 years, I was in that job for seven. Um, in the six years before then, I think two or three people had held that job and none of them had left willingly. So, 
um, it was kind of, I was looking at the situation being like, okay, I'm safe for now, but how much longer am I going to be safe in this job? You know, at what point do I become, you know, the guy in his, you know, late forties or fifties who has reached his potential and they want to bring in someone young to improve on their potential. And the only way to do that is to give them my job. Um, so that was kind of what was in the back of my mind of, Ooh. sure, I could do this job for another 35 years until I hit retirement, but will I, one, do I really want to stay in the same job for another 35 years? Two, uh, would I be able to stay in that job? And that was not a guarantee. Because I think you're definitely going places. Like the world seems like your oyster, you know, like I can't find a bad word we'll about see. you. You know, I mean, we'll are... see. The U.S. might ban TikTok, you know, and that'll <laughs> that'll put a damper on things. But I think we'll I see. think you would just create a new character and find a new way of doing it and moving. And you know, it's yeah. like you just seem to have a knack for it. I know you've been doing. You were saying you do it all your life, but you 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 seem to be born to perform to make people feel Thank better you. and do it. And you do phenomenal work. But until I can have you back on, I, I mean, I'd love to do ones and go into different things and bring you on with other people that I know you just bounce off so well. But what would you want them to take from this? Uh, people listening who think, you know, this guy's amazing. Who, you know, it can be about being themselves. It can be about like learning skills. It can be just anything. What would you like? What do you want people to come and see your work to, to remember? after about themselves about the world etc um well so i know what i want them to to think about me which is i want 100 percent is uh, one of the best compliments i've gotten is actually from a, a longtime friend of mine who i've known for you know a, more than a decade who said um if it were anyone else who had you know suddenly achieved this level of fame i would be worried about them but i'm not worried at all about you and so oh. What I what I hope people take away from me is I, I want to always um, continue to be a human, a regular human, and a good person. Um, as far as you know, from our conversation, what I want people to take away from themselves is um, pursue what you want to do. Don't don't do it in you know a reckless way. Don't quit your job right now if you don't have a, have a way to pay the bills. <laughs> Um, but keep at it because, you know, maybe that dream you had when you were 20 years old, like I did, um, it'll, you know, it might take until your early thirties to accomplish it, but you can have, you can still enjoy things along the way. I love a beautiful answer. And I love how that your, your only goal, this is to, you know, you're not talking about money. You're not talking about success. You just want to be a good person. And I think that comes across in your act. You're making people happy. You're putting a smile on people's faces, especially during this difficult time. And, you know, there's not enough laughter in the world. So to make people happy and come away, even if it's they're having a dark time in their life, you're making, you're giving them that opportunity just to enjoy themselves and be in the moment. And there's not many performers that do that. And you seem to be the same person you are as you perform. And, you know, Thank you. I, love, I love that about you, like that. I knew just from your emails that you were going to, you were the same person as you just dial it up a bit. And I think sometimes yeah. the best performers are themselves just tweaked <laughs> into the same level. So how can we follow on this journey? Um, you know, how can people follow on and see the success you're going to do? Are you going to be looking at more shows? Are you going to continue doing the Renaissance thing to dial in your act? Well, how can we follow on now, the journey? The the, I mean, the the best place, uh, if you want to find out where I'm performing, is jackthewhipper.com or jacquesiwhipper.com or jacklepiars.com. They'll all go to my website that has my full performance <laughs> schedule there. Um, if they want to get me performing closer to them, find an area, whether it's a Renaissance Festival or um, just even a theater um, that's, that's near you, nearby soon. Um, shoot them an email and say that you want to see me there. Um, there are a lot of places I would love to go, a lot of places I would love to perform. Um, I have gotten a lot of requests to perform uh, in the UK, a lot of requests to perform yes. in Europe, a lot of requests to perform all over the place. Um, and I would love to go to all of those places as someone, you know, this, as I sound so much like an American, uh, only been to Europe once in my life. So we would like to go back. So okay. that's that's the best thing to do. Jackthewhipper.com is where you can find my stuff and uh, email someone who, who can hire me. 
if you're if you're if I'm not performing near you. Well, that's it for another week, and thank you for listening. It's now time to take what you've learned and use it to develop and enhance your life with the key points mentioned. Listen, try it, embrace it, use it, and crush it. Now's your time to hit that next level in your life. If you liked this episode, then please leave a comment on the show notes or a review of the show on your podcast platform. Everything helps evolve the show. Until next week, keep seeking the next level in your life.